Hey everyone, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 544, being recorded Wednesday, May 22nd, 2019. Uh, I'm Jim Tannis. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Sebastian. Sebastian what? He sounds a bit Sebastian hasn't like, shaved in over a week. Uh, he's, he's so famous in the tech world anymore that he only goes by yeah, one name. I just go by yes. one name. Plus, I try to hopefully get some of Linus Sebastian's, like, you know, Google juice and, you know, followers, but it doesn't really work. Well, it's a it's a worthy strategy, leeching off the, uh, the success of others. But uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, for our video viewers, uh, you'll notice I am just a floating uh, icon avatar. Uh, we've had some technical issues this evening, so apologize for that. Actually, I don't apologize. You're probably better off not having to look at me. Uh, so just enjoy that while it lasts. Uh, we record normally Wednesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern. That's Thursday morning, 2 a.m. UTC. Uh, you can join us at pcpro.com slash live where we have the embedded video and YouTube chat. And uh, you can also, of course, go to our YouTube live page uh, if you p- prefer to watch over there. And then the usually the following morning, we have the on-demand version up uh, on YouTube and in, in your favorite uh, podcast app or podcatcher, whatever they're called. But uh, we're glad you could join us where we missed last week due to uh, some travel. And uh, we're going to have some interesting uh, scheduling next week. I'll be in Taipei for Computex. That is 12 hours ahead of uh, Eastern time where we normally base our, our timing off of. So we'll see how that works. We'll also see, uh, I've never been to Taipei, so, and I'm staying at a, a new hotel, so I don't know what the bandwidth and availability will be, but we'll try to get something going there. May, even if it's not a live podcast, we may just do some recording as we are available and then just post the, the videos and uh, audio clips up to our feeds. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll check that out. But to, uh, to uh, know when we go live, please head over to pcpro.com slash subscribe where you can join our mailing list. Uh, we, if we do go live, we send out a notice a few hours ahead of time to uh, to kind of let you know what the what the event's going to be and what you can expect. And uh, of course, you can also, if you want to support us, you can go to patreon.com slash pcper, uh, where you can help uh, support what we do here. And we have the ongoing Patreon. We need to come up with an official name for this. Uh, embarrassment Marathon or uh, something. Basically, if you become a new... Embarathon, yeah. <laughs> if you... Uh, Become a new patron during the live stream or increase your pledge if you're already a patron. Uh, if you basically, I will read your, I'll get a notification, I'll read your name live. Or if you edit the name field before you make your pledge, I'll also see that and I will read whatever message you put in the name field, with the sole exception being uh, that I won't read anything that will get me arrested, uh, especially now because I've got to get on an international flight in two days. That wouldn't be convenient. But, uh, Check that out, patreon.com slash pcper. Uh, all right, let's uh, jump into the news, or actually into the re- reviews. We've got a number of reviews, and I think they're all from Sebastian because he's just been a powerhouse the last week and a half. Uh, so, so can I divvy these I out? Like the can last I just six have months. Like, Josh can do sure. one of them, and Jeremy can do one of them. Well, or is anyone else prepared I to speak? I held back, too. There was another one I was going to release, and I'm like, no, there's already a bunch probably on the podcast <laughs> list already. I don't release one tonight. Um, is there is, is everyone else... I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that, but is anyone else qualified to speak authoritatively on these topics? Well, we could we could just blow through the coolers really quick. Pun intended. Okay. Well, so blow away. There. Blow through. Because these are air coolers. We did review... In the last two weeks, two low-profile coolers. The first one was from Silverstone. It's part of their Argon series. This is the AR-11. This one is basically positioned as a direct replacement to an Intel box cooler. It meets that like 47 millimeter height max. So if you have a low-profile enclosure, which you know there is one coming up on this list, the Desk Mini 310, that supports only up to 47 millimeters. This is an option. This gives you, you know, heat pipes. I think it has four heat pipes and a 92 millimeter fan. And the whole idea behind this is that it makes pretty much use of all available uh, space over the socket. This is a little bit larger than like the Noctua, like the ubiquitous Noctua NH 
uh, is it L9I, I I think. And the, the footprint of this is pretty big. In fact, it's a little bit too big. So I had to reorient it with the horizontal fins going, uh, with like the motherboard, like face each side of it was either facing the VRM heat sinks or the Ram. So I don't think that was exactly optimal, but it, it depends on your board. If you put this on a larger board, you'll have no issues. It's really tight. Mini, uh, Mini ITX designs, it might be a little bit tight with the, the heat pipes protruding just a little bit from the sides. But anyhow, getting to performance, it does a much better job than an Intel box cooler. Part of the reason for this is that the fan can spin up to 3,000 RPM. And a 92 millimeter fan going at 3,000 RPM is not quiet. So if you look, uh, we I quickly tested this against an Intel stock cooler and the CryoRig C7. I don't have the newer variants of the C7, like the CU. Uh, I have the original one, which I don't think is available anymore. But it was just a little bit behind that. Very excellent cooler. And then that was with an i3-8100, so not a demanding load at all. This is a quad-core part that basically replaced the 7th generation Core i5s. And then I used the, the cooler with the 7700K, the Core i7, and that thing is one of the hottest processors I've ever used. An Intel stock cooler will immediately hit 100 degrees. The 82.9 uh, mark on the chart is actually like an, a delta temp. It was at 100 and kind of like maxing out the T-junction temp there. This, the AR11, though, only 63.7, so you're, you know, 19 or so degrees cooler with the AR11 within the same size limitation. And then the CryoRig C7, which is just kind of an, uh, a standout for this size, this profile, was about a degree and a half better. But again, you can't buy it. And the AR11 also is a little bit more affordable. I want to say this is only a $35 or $37 cooler on Amazon when I released this review. So not expensive. The only drawback is when you look at noise, it definitely gets loud. Like if, if you should never really pair it with a Core i7 in a small enclosure, but if you decide to, it will keep it from overheating. It did a very good job. I even used it a few weeks ago in a build with that really slim like console sized case. And I had an i9-9900K in that thing with the AR11 cooler. And it got up to like 50 plus decibels as it did with my Core i7-7700K testing. We hit 53.2 decibels under full load, but I was under the thermal limits, so it didn't throttle the CPU. So it, it can keep a CPU cool up to 95 watts, where a lot of these smaller coolers are recommended only up to 65 watts, but it does it by spinning the fan at 3,000 RPM. So if you're okay with 50 decibels, then it's possible to do it, but I... It, I had a very hard time reconciling myself to that. I don't know how you guys feel about if if you were stuck with 47 millimeters, would you want to put an i7 into something that otherwise would be stuck with a core i5 or a 65 watt part? Yeah, well, that's kind of rough. Artilleryman, so it's a bit loud. Yeah. So anyway, under 40 bucks gives you the capability of extending a, a lower profile uh, enclosure to a 95 watt CPU and otherwise you'd be stuck with 65. So not bad. I would just like to see a quieter fan, which you can install your own fan, but you know, as shipped, it is quite loud under load. All right. Uh, well, thanks for that. Uh, just real quick, I want to jump in here to address uh, the chat um, toilet bug in the chat. Uh, Mr. Matt there wants to uh, know about the IRC chat. We uh, traditionally had an IRC chat as well. I think it's still technically functioning at irc.pcper.com if you have a IRC client. The problem is I don't have control of that server. We couldn't get it moved into my name. We're working. I didn't know how strong the demand for IRC was because I'm a fool. Uh, so we're going to we're gonna migrate that uh, at some point and just put a, build a new server, or set up a new server for IRC and get that switched over and implemented into the website. Uh, but we're just uh, working on... Uh, we have we have Discord, we have YouTube chat, we've got website comments, we've got this, and we're a small team. You know, we did lose three people uh, to start the year off, so please bear with us. Try to join at rc.pcper if you can, and we will get that implemented as soon as possible. So thanks for thanks for your passion there. I appreciate it. All What's right, up, uh, I'm monitoring it. 
Okay, yeah. So it is it is I'm working. You, you just need a client because we don't have it embedded on the site. So just get your IRC client and you can go to irc.pcpro.com for now. No more MIBIT. And that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Sebastian, uh, continuing on with the uh, next cooler. Yeah, you've got... I, actually, I have the cooler test bench in my hands here. I, I did this a few days ago. This is a scythe cooler. This is the big... What is it? Big Shuriken 3, I think this one is. Yeah, Big Shuriken 3. It's a 69 millimeter high cooler. This one's considerably larger. It actually will overhang the dim slots. And it's an asymmetrical design. It's designed to overhang them. It's much higher on that side. So as long as you're not using tall heat sinks, it's not going to be a clearance issue. I had, I would say, like a good half inch above the top of my dims. Standard height dims with uh, heat sinks on them. So this cooler, though, it's all about performance. And you you have a 120 millimeter fan on this, so it's a lot quieter. doesn't spin nearly as fast as that last one we looked at. And I was very impressed. If you look at its performance, if you just focus on the center of the chart, when I tested this with the Core i7-7700K, it is right behind the original Hyper 212 Evo. The, the newer variant of it is a little bit better i think because it has a, a a flatter surface it doesn't have the the direct heat pipes anymore and the new mounting system but the original hyper 212 evo which i recently retested was at 52.9 degrees delta and this big shuriken 3 was at 53.8 so a 0.9 degrees behind but this is a 69 millimeter high very compact air cooler and obviously the Hyper 212 is a taller design. It's around 160 millimeters high tower design. So very, very efficient. And then the noise was kind of middle of the pack. It's louder than an Intel stock cooler, but it's quieter than other recently tested low profile coolers like that CryoRig C7, like the AR11. And it's quieter than the Hyper 212 Evo, which actually was always around 45 decibels for me under load with these Intel uh, processor. So I was very, very impressed with this. And originally, I know the list on this was going to be $49.99. When I added the link and put it on the site, it was actually, let me see if it's still selling for, yeah, it's $44.99 on Amazon. So even better. <laughs> 45 bucks for a cooler that fits into places where you just can't fit a tower like the 212 Evo and gives you very similar performance and lower noise. So a very good option for a low profile cooler if you can go above that Intel box limit of 47 millimeters. All right. So a good enough for a gold award. Indeed. And we have our special guest. Kitty. Kitty approves. Kitty, look at that. Did you see that cooler? Is she a fan of low profile coolers? No, she's Ki- not. She's ah. no, they're harder to she's knock over. Today. What up, but, I mean, she keeps a low profile herself, right? I, I can see she the does. correlation. Yeah. What, do you see yourself up there? No. Anyway. Okay. Oh. <laughs> bye bye, Kitty. Uh they never they never act on command, do they? Sometimes, but not today. All right. So those were two low prof t- low profile CPU coolers. Uh, check out the full reviews at PCPro.com. It's the Silverstone Argon series AR eleven and the uh, Sky S- how do you how do you say that? Scythe? Scythe big Scythe or Scythe? I mean, the icy scythe of death. I don't really know how to pronounce that word. The the big Shuriken 3 low-profile cooler. All right. Okay, so next up again, as I warned you, a lot of Sebastian today. Unfortunately, also Uh, by me. But we can do this as like a committee thing. I just have some questions for everybody about this. This is a uh, a cooler. This is a keyboard, I think. This is from Rocat. Rocket. This is their... Is it Rocket? Rocket? Is it Rocat? I don't know how to. We've had this know. debate before, and I don't think we ever came to a conclusion. Uh, every it's time I have Vulcan Amo. This is why it's important to go to trade shows, to go to the booth and actually hear how it's pronounced by the reps. But sometimes they even get it wrong. But anyhow, this is the Vulcan 120 Amo, A I M O, which is their lighting uh, ecosystem. But the, this is their highest end keyboard. What's interesting about this to me. Not only is the design, which is kind of unusual, if you look at the pictures, you see a pretty big gap between keys, which you can see here. It's kind of an optical illusion, though, because the 
the spacing from like the center of the keys is I, is standard, but they're a very minimal. It's like they put a low profile keycap on a standard profile keyboard. So most of the key switch is visible from the side. And there is a tremendous amount of room in between these things. Like I took a regular microfiber cloth. It was just like, you know, going between the keys and getting everything out. It's very easy to clean. And they say that the key switches they used are uh, like dust proof switches. So they did something to kind of seal them up. But the the switches themselves are kind of the big story because it's yeah, look at a, that profile. That's yeah, it's, that's it's, actually it's, kind of sharp because because Rocket is is not exactly known for interesting things. Well, okay, maybe they're known for interesting things, but maybe not implementing them well. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very sharp looking, very angular. The top plate is aluminum, so it's very rigid. It has a very it has a premium kind of look. I, I liked the feel of the keycaps. They're nice, kind of concave and and easy to sort of like center yourself on. And it was it was good for typing. But the the switches feel different than anything I've ever tried. They're a tactile, non clicky switch. So immediately you think brown, and they're kind of a brown color. But it's a in house developed switch called the Titan from Rocat. And these I struggled to describe them in words. It's very difficult because it's not just the sound, it's the feel. These feel kind of like the brown, but a, a firmer version of the brown that springs back faster. It's like it's harder Can to push down. Can you show us with your fingers? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you can see any of this, but... Okay, like, oh, it looks a further distance. Oh. The, there's a, I think it's like a 3.4 millimeter total key travel. The actuation point is either is 1.8 millimeters. The you feel more resistance as you're pressing the key down, just a bit, but it feels very springy. And as soon as you stop pressing, it like bounces right back up against your finger. So it's a very very fast feel, but it doesn't make a lot. There's very little lateral movement. They feel very solid. So compare that to, you know, the IBM PS2, you know, those those classic buckle mechanical. Yeah, it's it's springy that, 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 like I don't have one of those keyboards. I've used one, but it's springy like that, but it's considerably, you know, quieter. And compared mm -hmm. to like this keyboard back here, which has cherry reds, like which are, you know, it's a bad comparison. These are linear key switches, but there's just there's a, it's it's easier to press them down and there's just almost a momentary delay before they pop back up. And with this keyboard, they're like it just feels like they're right back up against your finger as soon as you stop depressing them. Which is kind of what they were talking. They said also the that, that that's a result of the lightweight of the keycap itself by using so little material for the keycaps, they said that it allows the key switch to pop up faster. Okay. They, so you they, have the same amount of, of spring force to push against, but because you have less mass to push back, it it does it faster and more response. That's that's kind of clever. Yeah, they say that they are fifty percent lighter than standard keycaps for that rapid response, and they uh, recognize input twenty percent faster because of the way they've done their electrical contact. Electrical contact bouncing is kept to a minimum apparently. So it, it all sounded interesting. I was reading about this before I started the review and then in using it, it was just kind of, it took a while to get used to it because at first I was convinced that the keys were too far apart, but they really aren't. And then the feel of it is very different. So it's, it's one of those things where you'd have to try it out. I don't know if these are in retail anywhere where you could actually go and use one, but think of a firmer, but springier version of the MX Brown that's kind of what this feels like. Oh, it's so like the younger version of it. Yeah. Younger, firmer, uh, more yeah. supple. Shinier. More fun hey, uh, gaming how much does this it? cost? Oh. Yeah, you don't uh, want to know, da, 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 da. The list price on this is $159.99. Yeah. And bear in mind, this is this is another one of those keyboards. I didn't even get into the AMO thing. You can read the review uh, to learn about their lighting ecosystem. They, you know, It's one of those things like other companies have where the different things like your headset, the keyboard, they all can have a lighting profile. But this has like intelligent lighting profiles. If you enable it by default, I think it will just try to sense based on usage patterns. And I don't know if it's based on time of day, but 
it creates lighting for your keyboard for you instead of you actually setting like a, a pattern or zones. And of course you have the function of like every single key on this is remappable and you have per key lighting control as well in the software. So you can do all the same stuff you do with all the other per key lighting RGB keyboards that are out on the market. This even has like, uh, I, I've, I, I'm sure this is in other things, but I'd never seen uh, sound control. Like uh, you can change uh, like audible per key noise through windows with the software, which is something I have always done with Android, but never thought about on a windows PC. But anyhow, but plenty of software functionality that I didn't even get into here. That's in the review and overall very impressive build quality. Uh, I gave it the editor's choice, very slight knock on comfort just because of the wrist rest. That's where I dinged it on design too, because it's a hard plastic wrist rest and Something with a little bit softer material, perhaps like a soft touch might feel a little bit nicer. But the rest of the actual physical keyboard itself was top notch. I couldn't find anything really wrong with it. So if you were to firmly grasp it at one end and strike someone across the face with the other, how do you think oh, you I thought you were going to ask me to flex it, but no, that's there's next. There's very little flex. I mean, obviously, a thin sheet of aluminum would flex slightly, but between the aluminum and the ABS base, it's very. It's very durable, but you know what? These corners, Josh, I see what you're saying. That's aluminum. They cut you. Yeah. You could bash somebody in the side of the head with this thing. All right. So yeah, that's the Rocat uh, Vulcan 120 AMO keyboard. Check out the full review. All right. Next up, uh, again, we're continuing the Sebastian. Uh, not Sebastian P. Just plain old Sebastian. Yeah, just plain marathon. old Sebastian. Uh, the guy who reviews things for PCPer.com. And, and one we'll of the things, talk, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm stealing the thunder. <laughs> I was going to say, one of the things you reviewed, uh, one of the many things is the uh, new revision, revision two dark base pro 900 case from be quiet. Yeah. The, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the 900. They've had the dark base pro 900 for a while now. The rev two, I think was either announced at last Computex or it came out at some point last summer. I've been sitting on this review sample for a little bit too long. I've had it for a couple of months, but finally got to it. And if you remember the review we did on the Be Quiet Dark Base 700 White Edition a couple of months ago, this is, this is going to be very familiar because it's essentially the full tower version of that design. The Dark Base 700 is just the mid tower version of the Dark Base 900, essentially. There are some design differences internally. There are some big design differences externally. Both of them have aluminum panels. The Dark Base 700 uh, has an aluminum top panel and front panel. This has like an aluminum skin over all exterior panels, uh, except for the side panels. So top, bottom, front are wrapped in this identical brushed aluminum. And the, the thing about Revision 2 basically was that they added USB 3.1 Gen 2. Uh, there's a type C port on the top. There's also a charging port next to it. That's not a standard data port. And then two USB 3. So they dropped the USB 2.0 uh, front panel I.O. and replaced it with 3.1 and a charging port, which complements the Qi wireless charging pad that's on the top of this. That was also on the original version. So while this is running, you can throw your phone on top of it as long as it supports wireless charging. Uh, Android phones and even the newer iPhones support this. I was charging an iPhone 10 on this while I was building it that worked just fine uh internally though the first thing you'll notice if you open the front door you've got not the one. first thing i noticed when you open the front door two five and a quarter inch drive base. yes josh josh yeah. is absolutely right oh not God, one, baby door. But two. <laughs> two of them and, and you, you know can what? pop those this puppies out by just you doing the 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 the, the finger things. Yeah. 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 You, 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 you put your finger in the hole there and then you yeah. And then <laughs> and you squeeze this and is you say you don't like them. This, <clears throat> and, and you know what? It's, it's kind of cavernous in there. You can you can shove a really long optical drive in hot that, dog that mm. slot. Yeah. No. Fact, no I, I, I didn't in. put one, I put two in to test just to test the fit. Did did they touch? And, there was some no we're not gonna go there anyway we're not. uh so yeah uh this is an eatx full tower design it it comes with three 
of their uh, quiet 140 millimeter fans. It has an interesting kind of lower shroud. We see PSU shrouds on everything. The PSU PSU shroud on the bottom of this case has panels that come out of it and can you can repurpose the shroud for different things. You can either have one or two different 120 millimeter fans down there. You can add another SSD and the whole shroud comes out, which was the one kind of hang up I had about the build process is you pretty much have to take the shroud out to get the power supply in. Because and that's very- and that's not ironic for the site because you've got to get the shroud out. Oh, it's true. Yeah, you gotta get the shroud. Sorry, it doesn't keep- quite make it there, but you know, shroud, mm-hmm. shroud. Sure, get the shroud out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, this case is Ryan Shroud comes out, and then you can put the PSU in. But I just that was kind of odd because the PSU ends up mounting to a bracket and then. Uh, attaching to the rear of the case with an extension cable, and yet it's only about an inch and a half away from the rear of the case. So it's like, why are you using an extension cable to connect the PSU to the back of the case that's like an inch away? But but that's kind of like German engineering. I you mean, know, the one thing it you does, don't need it to be like that. Yeah. But let's do it anyway. Think about if you have a PSU that doesn't have a power switch. This has a power switch wired to that extension on the back, and it gives you a hard switch even if your PSU doesn't have it. That's the only thing I can come up with why you would do it this hmm. way. When's but, the last time you've seen such a thing that is, you know, like other than a 250 watt ATX 1998 power supply? My 1000 watt Silverstone, silver, whatever, like. 1000p you're power kidding that does like not have a toggle really? switch for no power toggle on switch on it no it does not but uh that's so bizarre anyway this this case it's got all the you know all the lining on the inside panels for noise reduction except for the, of course the tempered glass side panel which is four millimeters thick of tempered glass and it comes with a couple of lighting strips. I put mine on the inside, like front corner of it, and it syncs with your motherboard software. I just chose orange, just that's not like orange only. But we got the orange edition of the case, which has like a little. Is strip that competition thing. orange? Uh, it's motherboard orange. It's gigabyte oh, okay. motherboard orange. I'm not sure what. Oh, what be else quiet. To call it. Good morning. Oh, I'm man. sorry. I know. <laughs> I need to prime so, a rim shot soundboard, but. <laughs> Uh, as I continue to smack this microphone, sorry about that. But yeah, look, it, I proved it in this picture. It can do more than orange. I used green because because RX, RTX graphics card. So with this case, I got thermals that were just fine. I got low noise. I think the loudest I got was under 34 decibels. Yeah, 33.2 with the fan set to high. But that's kind of misleading because there's like with the Dark Base 700. There's multiple ways to change fan speeds, and there's actually two different zones. So the fan controller that comes built into this has two sides, and each one supports, I believe, four fans. And you can toggle on the left or right side whether you want the silent or performance mode. And then in addition to that, there is a stepless speed controller slider inside the front door but above the five and a quarter inch base. Where you can just slide that to the left or the right to go lower or higher on fan speed Overall fan speed is still governed by the selectors for each zone, if that makes any sense. But you can get really into fan speed control and have like your rear or top fans different than your front fans and all that. So with just the out of the box configuration of that fan controller, I did low and high, still very quiet. And while I didn't compare this to other stuff, because yet again, I've changed the I wanted a more demanding thermal load because this is so insulated, so I put in a RTX 2080 Ti instead of the older GTX 1070 I'd been using, and temperatures were fine. Like GPU load of like 54, ambient uh, was I think around 20, so I was hitting like 70, 72, 74 degrees with multiple runs of a benchmark to try to heat up the GPU. So it. Even though these cases are really insulated, if you look closely at them, like the shot we're looking at right now, if you're watching on the video, 
that metal grill around the edge, that's air intake. It's all around it. So it's it's drawing in air from the bottom. It's drawing in air from the sides of the front panel and the top panel. And there's a surprising amount of airflow, especially if you have the front fan set to a higher like performance mode. So sh- you shouldn't really have big thermal issues with this. But of course, there are going to be cases with better thermal performance if they're like have open front panels like mesh style cases with you know higher rpm fans but this is all about being quiet obviously that's the brand it's a company that started out making just those low noise panels now they make the whole case sand power supplies and coolers and so it's it's good it's the one thing i had trouble with like i've had trouble with everything recently is price where i apparently slept through about two years woke up and every computer case is like two hundred dollars now yeah i didn't think inflation was that bad but every case i've touched in like the last oh. three months is like 180 dollars plus mm-hmm. i don't know what's going on with that but 269 dollars for this case the one thing that i i thought could help justify it was the fact that it doesn't just come with an accessory pack there's no uh ziplock of screws with this case there's a box that that was like zip tied to the inside of the case when I opened it, and inside of it are three additional hard drive cages. It came with additional like supports and mounts for liquid cooling and air cooling and 2.5 millimeter drive mounting. It comes with the two light strips, which work with its internal controller and with your motherboard header, and like a pack of like velcro ties and it's it's a very deluxe kind of package so if you think well there's like an extra you know ten dollars each for those hard drive cages i think when you buy them separately and it it helps justify the maybe some of that premium over the two hundred dollar mark but you're essentially looking at a at least a two hundred dollar enclosure wherever you find this for sale so i i I would personally get the 700 because i don't need a full tower but if you need the full tower you want a little bit of additional storage and you want those two optical bays, of course, which were not in the 700. Then this is an interesting alternative to cases like the much less expensive fractal design Define R6, which has one optical bay and is designed to be quiet. This is a much larger, very quiet, extremely well engineered, you know, it's built like a tank. One of the first things that happened, and I, this was a terrifying moment, I got this out of the box, I put it up on this table right here, and I started taking the thumb screws off of the glass side panel side, and I got the third one off, and then I started to get the fourth one off. wasn't even thinking, and this table's not level, and as soon as I got the fourth one off, the glass went flying, and it landed on the floor, the cement floor, and didn't break, so... Four millimeter thick tempered glass on this case is very strong. I found like Dang. one scratch on a corner. So it's, it's very well made. How much does it, you think it weighs with, with everything in there? Like, you know, two hard drives, video card, decent CPU fan, one optical it's, drive, because those I are hefty. I don't remember if the specs are on. I It's heavy. It's like a 14.39 kilo empty. So, yeah. holy it's cow. Probably close to 20 Not, kilos. Not light. Because when wow. you think aluminum, like, like the, the the 700, the top and front were thin pieces of aluminum. That was it. And it was a very light case. This is aluminum skin over metal and plastic. And the entire internal frame is steel. And it's it's not a light case at all. You don't so want to fully loaded, it, it could be 50 pounds of, of mm-hmm. case. That's, yeah. not, that's not inconsequential. No. But you know what? It's so if you were to get onto your roof and throw it at someone, never mind. <clears throat> I, I sent some, the last one some use the keyboard in Josh. Use the keyboard for your aiming shot and then follow it up. Exactly. With the case. Bash people with the corners of your sharp keyboard, throw your case off the, off the roof. Although that, that would be a great way of uh, downsizing my uh, case collection. Just throw them off the yeah. roof. Throw one at the mailman or letter carrier, I should say. Mine is a lady. But anyhow, that is well, the Dark Base 900 Rev 2. Jim is uh, just horrified right now. He's not even yeah. saying anything. Because... Look at, but look at the smile on my face. Yeah, it hasn't changed, <laughs> yes. though. It almost seems a little forced. 
it Honestly, is a little forced. Okay, so let's let's finish up the Sebastian show. Yeah, well, one one more, real quick. Yeah. Just just because. So in my hand is a mini PC from Asrock. This is the Desk Mini 310. And no, I'm sorry. I apologize to anybody in advance. This is not the AMD version. They sent us the Intel version. I have asked them about the AMD version, and they said, why don't you get that one reviewed first? Which, you know, fair enough. So I got through this review, and I am looking forward to an AMD version at some point because this is a really nice little kit. The case is well-made. It comes apart easily. The accessory kit that it comes with is great. has a nice... High quality. They sent along a couple of extra accessories, I'll add. They sent the optional uh, Visa mount kit and wireless kit, which comes with like a little one by one Intel wireless card and the antennas. But the the actual kit for the Desk Mini itself in the box is very comprehensive. It comes with the case with the pre installed motherboard. It's a mini STX form factor. So you're, you have a LGA socket, it's rated up to 65 watts. Although the power supply that it ships with is a beefy AC Bell power supply that's 120 watts. So, I mean, you could you could experiment with, you know, like that AR11 cooler and a Core i7 if you really wanted to. But uh, it's a H310 chipset, so this is 8th and ninth generation CPUs. And, again, that 65-watt limitation. The bottom of the CPU or the motherboard tray includes two 2.5-inch... Two uh, SSD or hard drive mounts. Obviously, you also have you know your M.2 slots on the board. There's one for your wireless card. There's a full PCIe Gen 3 by 4 slot for your M.2 drive. And pretty basic I.O. available, although you can expand it somewhat. This comes, like among other things in the box, comes with a serial port if you wanted to punch that out on the back of the case and if you needed one for some you know purpose. It comes with Additional USB ports. There's punch outs on the top side to add more USB ports if you wanted to with the motherboard header. It comes with that. Uh, but out of the box, it has HDMI, display port output, VGA output, USB 3, USB 2, and an Intel gigabit NIC, which is nice. And although I think I forgot to put it into the review, the Intel NIC performed perfectly fine. Like I did some iPerf testing on the network and it was going at full speed. I did a quick build with a Core i3-8100, quad-core, you know, under that 65-watt TDP limit. I tested the fit with both an Intel box cooler and that AR11 that I have laying around, and both fit just fine. The case uh, has, like, plastic tracks on the inside of it, and the motherboard tray slides right out the back. You can add a lock to it if you want to. There's, like, a, a hole to put, like, a small lock through. If you uh, were putting this somewhere we wanted it to be secure, there's like a Kensington, Kensington lock slot and a lock for the case itself. So this is meant to be, it could be like a, you know, I can see these at places like, you know, libraries or banks or something, anywhere where there's like a small uh, internet connected workstation. But you could build yourself a pretty significant little system if you don't need dedicated graphics. And of course, this is where the Intel or the uh, AMD version of this would be interesting as well because the a300 version of these desk minis you can put you know a ryzen apu into that and, and have at least some pretty decent gaming performance but for 169 dollars, if you consider this to be an alternative to an intel nook it's bigger than a nook it's bigger than the last mini stx computer that i built which was a few years ago it was a silverstone mini stx case and an ecs motherboard but that required one of those like 20 seven or 28 millimeter cooling fans was very low profile being able to use a standard intel box fan not only cuts down on the cost because you're getting one if you buy a retail cpu anyway but it means you could use you know higher tdp or or you know higher core count processors if you really wanted to i know there's at least a couple of core i9s that are eight core that meet that 65 watt threshold because they have lower clocks you could put together something that at 169 for the kit, which includes the motherboard, case, and power supply, you add yourself like you know a modest CPU, like 100, 150 dollars for a, a decent quad core CPU, and you know add some RAM storage. You're only at a few hundred bucks, and if you think about say the Mac Mini, for example, which I checked out the specs when I was writing this up, and it's appalling to me that the latest iteration of that computer is 
base price of $799. It has the same Core i3-8100, I believe, that I used in this build. And it's obviously not upgradable unless you tear it apart. I don't remember if it has SODEMs or not. The last version didn't. I think this one actually does again. It does, yeah. It comes with, it comes with a woeful 128 gigabytes of storage. And I used the same... Western Digital, uh, it's the SN 750 drive I've used for a few things lately that, Jim, you did that quick review on earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. And that thing has just tremendous throughput. Like, sequential numbers on that are as good as just about anything on the market. And it was running at full speed, well over its 3,400 plus megabytes per second. It wasn't held back at all, which I was kind of curious, because if you actually read the specs for the 310 chipset, it doesn't officially support Gen 3 uh, PCI, but I believe that's a function of the CPU. So... I was good there, but it, for really fast storage, you could put up to eight cores in this theoretically, and I was impressed with the build quality of the case and with like the even the power supply. This wasn't the cheap power supply that it comes with, and for $169, I thought it was a pretty good deal. And yes, I know it's not the AMD version. I'm sorry. Which is really hard to find. I was poking around seeing if I could spot it, and it's out of stock anywhere that I looked. There's demand. People want that tiny AMD APU build. I've been listening to comments for probably four or five years since I started doing some mini PC reviews for the site. And every time I got a new mini PC in, I was like, yeah, and I can't wait. As soon as I would publish it, it was like, ah, oh, man, I wish this had an APU in it. Or, yeah, but it's not AMD. And they wanted something in the living room that had better graphics you know, capabilities. And Well... In such a form HD factor, it seems that like graphics is. I got to make sure I'm not muted. Anyway, <clears throat> oh, yeah, it's such a small form factor. Graphics is a lot more important than than CPU power, and so Intel has kind of been on the wrong side of that uh, that balance. I mean, they're improving, but still, you know, yeah, you know, having a decent GPU to play some some basic 3D games and. Even some more advanced 3D games. And hey, I want to play Skyrim on my big 55 inch 4K TV and, you know, 1080p upscaled. But, you know, it doesn't matter because it works. And they've got still better drivers yet. Yeah, the APU side's gotten a lot better, especially now that, like with the 2200G and the 2400, those, when they came out, I did a build for somebody when they were brand new and there was like a separate release for the drivers for those and you you'd have to wait a couple of cycles through the desktop side to even get APU updates which were not very frequent and now it's all like unified as soon as a new Radeon driver comes out you can install it on your APU so much much better in that way but we've all listened to me talk far far enough long enough well thank you for all that uh, all those good reviews and and you can as always check out the full written review all the photos and all that at pcpro.com for all of those products. Uh, we are going to take a break, though, real quick. Uh, we're going to talk about our sponsor. They're back. I love these guys. This is Clear. So if you've heard me talk about this before, we, they just became a sponsor a few months ago and genuinely have changed so much for me now that I'm traveling so much more. So if you don't recall when we talked about them a few weeks ago, Clear is, the point of Clear is basically helping you get where you need to go faster. Because for better or worse, security screening is now just a part of the experience at public venues like airports and stadiums. And at the same time, things like biometric security, which is basically using you as the password or as your, your identity, is becoming uh, more common. And Clear is really at the forefront of that. They help you at stadiums and airports get through security by using biometric security. Your fingerprints, your retina scan, usually it's just fingerprints, although you do register with the retina and it replaces the need for a physical ID card. How this works is you get to a venue that has a clear location or that has a clear, uh, a clear or that are partners with clear. And there's the regular checkpoint security line and then there's the clear line. And once you're enrolled, you just go to the clear line and without having to get your wallet out and take your ID out or anything, you just put your fingers on the scanner and they walk you right through to the security area uh, that you get right in. And signing up for this is super easy. Just go to clearme.com slash PCPer and start the enrollment process there and then head to a clear location. 
Once you're there, a clear ambassador will help you finish the enrollment process, after which you can immediately start using the service. And as I said, it's not just airports. They're, they're, the majority of their locations are currently airports, but they're also at several stadiums throughout the country. So that means you can get through security, catch your flight without having to worry about being late or make sure you get to your seats before kickoff or before the concert starts and you're not stressed, you're not worried about that. You're also not inconvenienced just having to stand in a line uh, because the clear process gets you through so much faster. And even if clear is not available at your local airport, because they're, they're at over 40 locations uh, nationwide so far, but even if they're not at your local one, which unfortunately they're not at Cincinnati yet where I am, you can still take advantage if you travel frequently because they're going to be at the airports and stadiums you're traveling to. So with all this travel I've been doing since uh, I took over here at PC Per, I, I, going, I go to San Francisco, LaGuardia, wherever I'm going, there's often a clear location. So I can still take advantage of it coming back through those airports. And that has made all the difference. I think the last time we talked about clear, I mentioned how at San Francisco, they had saved me a ton of time because the line was about an hour long and I got through in like just a couple minutes. And that was just about convenience. It just, ha I wasn't late. I was, I was early for my flight. It wasn't a, a, a big deal, but it just helped me get through, sit down, have a drink, relax. not have to worry about standing in a long line. Uh, this most recent trip in San Jose was another story. I was late to the airport. I was a little bit stressed out. My flight was, you know, close to boarding and the security line was quite long. And I was relieved when I turned the corner and saw that clear line uh, at the security checkpoint because I walked right up scanned my fingers and was through. And again, last time I think I was, I was estimating. I said, I think I got through in a couple minutes. This time I wanted to be sure. So I started my timer on my phone, scanned my fingers, went through and then checked the timer once I had, you know, everything back on once I was past security, 87 seconds. It took me 87 seconds to clear security at the San Jose airport when the line was I mean, I don't want to say it was an hour long, but there were about, you know, probably close to 100 people in line. And I got through in 87 seconds, thanks to clear. That's the benefit. And, and because of that, I didn't have to worry about missing my flight. I didn't have to stress. That's the beauty. It only takes one of those moments when you're traveling to make the service worthwhile. To also, if you're, if you're a clear member, up to three family members can be added to your account at a discounted rate. And if you have children traveling with you under 18, they are free. So you can enroll them for free and they'll get through clear as long as they're with you or a, a clear member when they're there. So clear has really made an immediate improvement to my travel experience. Uh, I love this service. It has saved me so much time already. It's going to continue to save me time in the future uh, because I'm, I'm not, they're not just a sponsor. I'm a, I'm now a paying member. I've enrolled them. It's my own money because it's, it's, it's that worth it. It's not worth it if you don't travel. If you never travel, sure. But if you go to stadiums or you go through airports, even occasionally, this can save your save your butt. So check that out. Uh, PC Per listeners can get two months of clear for free to try it because you really do need to try this. Don't take my word for it. Try it yourself. Two months free. Go to clearme.com slash PC Per. That's C-L-E-A-R-M-E dot com slash PC per and use offer code PC per when you check out and you'll get two months for free. So if you've got a trip coming up or if you're going to be going to a concert or uh, a sporting event and there's a clear location where you're heading, sign up, try it out, see how awesome it is uh, to get you where you need to go to get you through those lines, reduce stress and, uh, and just make, make the whole experience better. Clearme.com slash PC per C L E A R M E.com slash PC per and offer code PC per we thank clear for their support. Uh, I, like I said, I have become a paying customer. I'm putting my money where my, or my money where my mouth is. Is that the thing? So, uh, check it out. If you're travel frequently, it's a great service. And we thank clear so much for the support of the PC perspective podcast. All right. Well, back to the show. Uh, let's uh, jump into the news and right off the bat, uh, some more drama with the Epic game store. Why don't you tell us about this, Jeremy? Well, I mean, new game distribution platforms always start out perfectly and never have any issues at all. Uh, you know, and, and support is perfect. But Epic's sort of gone an extra step to make sure that you remember their launch. They're, they're currently hosting a mega sale, which is honestly pretty good because a lot of the games are up to 75% off. A lot of them are cheaper than they are on Steam. And literally every time you buy a game worth 15 bucks or more, they knock 10 bucks right off the price. 
Now, you don't have to worry about the, the, the bundle of games you're purchasing not adding up and taking the right $10 off because, well, they don't have a shopping cart. The, the, they're looking to build one, but for now, this is something they don't have. It's produced a very interesting side effect, which is that people are now getting blocked from their Epic account for buying too many games that are on sale. And too Epic. many games is as little as five, right? Uh, yes. Uh, essentially, if you go for that sixth game, sorry, you are being greedy and we're locking you out until you talk to customer service. They're claiming that it's uh, the anti-fraud system because it's noticing that you're doing multiple purchases via the same credit card. So maybe a little bit suspicious, except for the fact that that is literally the only bloody way you can buy them. So, you know, for now you might, do three or four purchases, wait a while, and then maybe do another two or three. Because as I say, the deals are pretty good. Unless you were looking to pre-order, and you know how we stand here at PC Per about pre-orders, but some people still refuse and continue to do it. If you're hoping to get the new Paradox uh, Vampire the Masquerade game, well, Paradox sort of pulled it at the very last minute. And so it's not available currently on the store and doesn't look like it will be for the remainder of the sale. Even stranger Borderlands three, which again was being pre-ordered via Epic and the, uh, head of, uh, gearbox, uh, who goes by the name of, if I can remember, uh, Randy Pitchford actually tweeted, which has since been deleted that, Hey, go over here, pick up our game. You know, not only do you get a deal because it's pre-order, you get an extra $10 off except two K pulled it and so now you can't again get borderlands 3 during the remainder of the sale I, I will point out for those that don't remember when steam first launched it was a cluster word and their support remains so to this day so don't completely lose your mind over it but at the same time it's it's a horrible first impression when here we're having a great sale but you know make sure you don't buy too much or we're going to kick you out uh, i'll and point out that steam yeah it had its uh growing pains and it didn't have a shopping cart at first i don't think but that was 15 years ago yeah you'd think epic could you know implement a shopping it, cart. it's in their long-term goals <laughs> all right well so so you know be wary of the epic situation try not to buy so many games at once and uh it does look like their support staff is dealing with situations as they arise but that's inconvenient as always all right uh remember next up when we... steam steam was the only way to get cs 1.4 uh remember i don't Bar remembers oh okay i mean steam has been yeah. a place to get a lot of or the only place to get a lot of certain games but uh yeah i think i i made the my my account in 2003 but yeah it's uh <clears throat> that was like the only way to get an update on on counter-strike Wow. Is is you you went to Steam and it was like 1.4, 1.6. I can't remember exactly because it's been 16 years. Uh, indeed, indeed. All right. Well, uh, looking at because uh, I don't want to go too late here. Let's power through some news. We've got an update to Firefox, Firefox 67. It, it has added some uh, performance boosts and also uh, I don't think Scott noticed it or noted it here in his article, but. It is also, uh, if you have Firefox 67 on Windows 10 with an NVIDIA graphics card, it will enable the new rendering engine as well. Uh, that can be enabled. I think it's enabled by default. They said that's like 4% of their user base, that combination, uh, specific combination of users. But uh, that is coming out. So that's their new sort of unified uh, rendering engine. So uh, we're looking at uh, performance improvements for certain websites, certain scripting, prioritizing certain scripting to improve perceived performance and loading. Uh, so some nice improvements, some nice work with uh, Firefox. So make sure you update Firefox. Of course, you have to uh, generally will auto update if you quit the browser. But if you leave it running all the time, like we do, uh, make sure to go into the about menu and manually restart to grab, grab your latest version of Firefox. All right. And then another software update. Uh, this is Ada 64 6.0 is here. We talked about some of the betas, I think, right, Jeremy? But uh, this is the final release. 
Yep, this is the upgrade for 6.0. And if you already own a license, you are able to upgrade for free, which is always nice. Uh, Final Mark is very good at that sort of thing. And honestly, that this new one, uh, you know, it'll add some support for Matisse and in theory, the uh, two new Navi GPUs, as well as Comet Lake. But for the RGB fans, it now is compatible with a whole crap load of things with OLEDs and LCD displays. So if you've got like a Cooler Master MP750 mouse pad, you can actually convince it to start showing you visual data out of ADA uh, or a couple of the, the Steel Series rival uh, mice as well, which might be a little more interesting. Uh, Corsair's H100 and H15i will also be able to accept data from ADA. So you'll be able to sort of see in real time what is going on because this has got to be one of my favorite tools just to see what's going on with the system and to just do a very quick uh, and relatively accurate stability test. It, it, it's very picky and it will tell you if it doesn't like what your system's setting at. So if you've got it already, definitely pick it up. If you don't, it's the, the extreme is very useful and it's not a lot of money and it just tells you a lot about your system. It will also presumably not prevent you from booting uh, when you update to the Windows 10 May update. Oh, is that an issue? Compatible. It is with just about every other piece of software or hardware ah. on the planet. <laughs> oh, well, all right. Good, good on 1903 there. Okay. <laughs> let's, uh, let's move on to our next story. We've got uh, some more rumors because uh, Computex is coming up next week and obviously AMD is expected to have some big announcements. Lisa, uh, Lisa Sue is doing the kickoff keynote for Computex. And uh, some additional rumors here. Tell us uh, what this is, Jeremy. Well, it's Computex season, so we are going to get a lot over the coming week. It's it's the 27th that officially uh, this is going to start happening. So, you know, not too long. But this one was an interesting trio of leaks. First off, someone posted what is presumably the layout for the new X50, or X570 chipset from AMD. So... You, you, and you can call it Walhalla if you like. It has, as everyone's been expecting, PCIe 4.0. And from the looks of it, you'll get 16 lanes for your graphics card. So either a single 16 by or a pair of eights, if, you know, for whatever reason you want to go that way. Support for, according to the diagram, up to three M.2 uh, connectors, which is really nice. Uh, and of course, one of them swaps back and forth with the SATA ports, but... I mean, at this point, SATA is sort of for cold storage. It, 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 there's no comparison between it and NVMe. Uh, other than that, we don't really know a huge amount about it. Uh, you'll expect a, a newer as media onboard audio solution and a variety of different network cards. Uh, there's a killer one and uh, an Intel one, but they'll all be Gigabit uh, cards. So we should see several uh models being released you know within i would say end of june uh early july from the way that the weeks are talking about the next leak is more interesting for a lot of people because it is talking about navi xt and navi pro or as they're being dubbed uh over at wccf tech the rx 3080 and rx 37 or 3070 because we just need more similar newly named GPUs to not confuse us. We don't really know a huge amount about the performance, but it, it's sort of confirming the rumors that we've been hearing previously, which is Navi XT is going to sit, you know, a little bit above uh, the RTX 2070 as far as performance goes and pretty much bang on the same price at $500 for a normal card. And, you know, at this point, the 2070 you're seeing maybe dip a little bit below 500, but not too much. And the overclocked cards are still set in 530, 540. So expect to see this being a fairly reasonable rumor, uh, unless something horrible has happened somewhere. The second card, the Navi Pro, will be similar between the RTX 2060 and 2070. And at a $400 price tag, one hopes it's a lot closer to that 2070 because a 2060 is significantly cheaper than that. 
But then again, it could be that it runs a little cooler. It's a little less power hungry. And it, it, and it is, of course, seven nanometers. So sexy, right? Uh, we will, we'll sort of see how those go. Uh, again, we're sort of expecting the announcement at Computex. And the reviews we're probably not going to be able to see until, you know, towards the end of June. Which, again, is pretty much bang on from what we've been hearing for months now. The final one uh, is for the server fans. It is a Sysoft Sandra result for what looks to be one of the new Rome Epic processors. Now, this is a different one than the original leak. leak. There was one before. Uh, so that one was a 64 thread version. This, or sorry, that was uh, the 32 thread version that clocked faster. Uh, so this one is a bit bigger. Uh, so 32 cores, 64 threads. It's a little bit slower than you might expect uh, compared to the previous model at 1.7 gigahertz stock, turbo of 2.4. It, it's It feels slower. It's, it's like it certainly specs slower, but then again, this is quite likely an engineering sample, so I wouldn't bet the farm on this being the final uh, frequencies. And, you know, it is quite possible that 7 nanometer is causing them to sort of back off a little bit, at least for the, the initial builds, because it is a difficult one. I, I mean, this is a huge jump that no one has done before and is so far ahead of Intel, it's, it's kind of amusing. So, you know, we will sort of see what happens as it comes. We're, we should know one way or to other come uh, once uh, you will get to watch Lisa give her flagship speech. And I'm sure you'll tell us all about it, right, Jim? I, I will try, although I'm looking at that uh, that keynote and it's there's it's just open admission to your Computex registra uh, registries or uh, whatever the word is. So I'm going to have to fight to get packed. It's going to be packed. Just I, tell I, them you know Sebastian. That's right. Sebastian. Yes. Just Sebastian. <clears throat> you know, out of all that news, the, the thing that kind of strikes me most is the uh, the X570. <clears throat> okay, maybe not the thing that strikes me the most, but uh, the first thing that pops out. Um, this is going to be an actively cooled chipset because apparently the PCI 4.0 PLX chip that they, well, or portion of that, is what takes up the majority of, of power and produces more heat uh, in, in the chipset. And so, yeah, everything that I've seen so far and all leaks, every single one of these x570 chipsets has active cooling and that's going to be something that people are going to be upset about because you know the x370 x470 very cool running chips you know you only need a basic heat sink on it good performance good feature set as compared to what intel offered um but yeah the addition of pci 4.0 is it's it's significant at the uh at the uh the process nodes and and designs that they have for these chipsets, which is a bummer. Um, the density of of these Epic servers in terms of 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 cores and threads is really tremendous. And you know, IPC is is a big deal. I think we're going to see an improvement in these Zen two cores, but in terms of per threads per socket. AMD is going to have a significant lead from Intel. And sure, these are going to be 300-watt TDP parse, and they're going to need some serious cooling. But, yeah, that's a lot of compute density. And so don't get turned off too much. I mean, if, if you're an enterprise person, you're looking at this, and you're looking at price, you're looking at power, you're looking at the amount of threads that these things have. It's a bigger deal than than what some of the uh, you know the initial specs that are coming out. We may not get these boost clocks that we're kind of hoping for, but yeah, the the compute density is is pretty tremendous. And so the results that we will see eventually from you know benchmarking and then third party people doing this stuff, uh, you know, AMD has a unique product that looks to be coming up, and uh, this may not be the most compute dense solution that they have so pay attention in the next couple of weeks and see what goes on we have to factor in the continuing impact of uh security mitigations 
I mean, yeah. this latest round of MDS stuff, mm -hmm. again, it doesn't apply to everyone, doesn't apply to every workload, certain, there's a, there's a risk benefit kind of, or risk cost measurement that certain companies have to take. But with each, each new round that comes out that primarily, that seems to primarily affect Intel, you know, AMD is, is whatever disadvantage they had in IPC is shrinking when you apply those mitigations. So. Yeah, especially considering AMD's SMT is not affected the way that Intel hyperthreading is, and in certain circumstances, depending on what your actual application is and what your requirements are, you may be in a situation where your sec most secure option on the, the Intel part is to disable hyperthreading, thus losing, mm. you know, not significant straight half of your performance, but like forty percent of your performance. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 looking for, for those situations where that is a requirement for security reasons. It's it, it I mean you're you're talking about erasing multiple generations of performance benefit, you know. Like if you, if you take a processor and you have to disable hyperthreading and what does that performance now look like compared to what you, you know, could have bought 5 years ago? And then also with Intel on their consumer side in particular, not offering hyperthreading on their higher end SKUs, not, not on all of them. So like the i7 versus the i9, you pay that premium for hyperthreading. Now you take you have to take it away for security reasons. What did you pay the premium for? I mean, maybe cash or something. But so it's, it's a very tricky situation, and we'll see. We'll, I mean, we'll see how this continues and how many more of these vulnerabilities pop up, and if they do start to affect AMD as well. Uh, but uh, keep an eye, keep an eye on it. Yeah. All right, uh, continuing on with the news, we've got a uh, story here. Uh, Sebastian wrote up for us about some DDR4 overclocking records with Micron EDI memory. Yeah, and I was originally thinking EDI because of the, there's discussions online about BDI versus EDI, and it pertains, I think, exclusively to Samsung memory. This is Micron EDI, but BDI is generally favored for overclocking and they apparently had no issues whatsoever pushing this. This is a retail memory they were using, apparently, which is the Ballistics Elite 3600 kit. I was actually sent one of these kits, which, of course, I have not uh, gotten to yet, but I will not be putting it under LN2 like these people did to get this ridiculous uh, record, which was 5,726 megatransfers per second, which, you know, was a world record for many hours before apparently already I'm looking at the HW bot charts and another team from Taiwan apparently used some sort of a data XPG memory to eclipse this already, but very, very, very fast performance from this EDI micron stuff in some memory that is available to consumers. So interesting. I have not tried my hand at overclocking any of this stuff yet. At least uh, when I wrote this, it was the fastest memory in the world. So are you going to expense some liquid nitrogen? Uh, I, no. Oh. Even even for fun. I don't even, <laughs> I have no idea how to, to safely handle it. I don't want, I don't want to deal with the company. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I would, we're insured for that. No, I would love to bring on a contributor who would love, you know, to do this. I'll send him the RAM, but. Sure. Yeah. No, if anyone out there is be. experienced with this and wants us, we'll send you hardware uh, and we'll pay for the Allen too, but, will but we? you can do the work oh, on your sure. own. Okay. Yeah. Jim will. Jim is volunteering to pay for the Allen too. We'll, we'll rent it. We want you to capture it back and uh, put it back in the bottle when you're done. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Last story. So uh, if you guys recall, Sebastian did a review of EVGA's new, new, new audio card, NU which was their high-end audio card they released at CES. And I guess they've uh, come out with a software update recently to add 3D, uh, I guess for, for more of a, is this for gaming or for 3D audio, like 3D music? It's gaming oriented. It's, they, they specifically, there's more than one Nahimic uh, 3D audio uh, thing. Like when you go to their website, you can look at a couple different options they have. This is their 3D audio for gamers. It does, you know, the, what you'd expect virtual surround like positional virtual surround effects for gaming and and movies and and just kind of creates your own virtual surround like what we see from motherboard solutions and other things that integrate either nahimic or some other similar technology two things actually happened here kind of the the hidden story here is that evga dropped the price of the card 
which I thought was originally just going to be a temporary thing. It's been about a week now, and it went from EVGA doing an instant rebate on their own website to take it down to $199 from $249 to Amazon is now selling it for $199, ships and sold from Amazon, and then Best Buy lowered the price of theirs like two days ago to $199. So at least right now, it's less expensive than it was, and it's kind of more of a mainstream option because of this virtual surround support, where when it launched, it was a very ambitious product because it was a very high-end, premium-priced sound card that focused on simply two-channel audio. Did not initially have any surround support of any kind, uh, except for like SPDIF, like 5.1 output to another DAC, like to your home receiver or something. But actually what it was outputting was just two channels through RCA or the uh, audio jack for headphones. And they've also tweaked some of the software a little bit. It's a little bit nicer, uh, easier to use. There's some quick EQ options. Uh, like just click quickly, like, oh, I want more vocal clarity. Or I'd like to increase space or treble. There's just big like uh, controls for that now instead of having to manually go through and mess with a, a wide band equalizer. Just enhancing what it was already pretty solid software experience from this in my opinion anyway, and giving the virtual surround support makes it more compelling when you can, when you compare it to high-end options from, say, Asus, some of the other cards that are out there in kind of that $200, $250 range on the very high end. And I will officially, on this podcast, uh, lobby for the inclusion of the new audio card on our dream system, Jeremy, and not some like Turtle Beach sound card that's been extinct for uh, approximately 15 years. But that's just my opinion. It was the best. Well, it was the best. And that was probably in the the days of, you know, like 44, 1 and 58 or 48 being the highest. You know, Sound Blaster still makes video uh, sound cards and they've got a new one Mm -hmm. coming out. Oh, they do. Yeah. Interesting. That's 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 the uh, that's the rumor. The E9 or something like that. Hmm. I'll have to email them. Yes, repeatedly. Because sound cards are still relevant, guys. Jeremy, I you know now that I got Fine, rid of SLI, I have got, I have space in my. You computer. got room in there. <laughs> I do. And mo- most of them don't even require a power cable, so you don't have to route any more well, messy cables. Yeah, I mean, the, the new audio, the new audio does. That's true, but thing. it's All but right, it's worth so it. I'll downgrade it to uh, a GTX 1080, so I can fit in. Uh, couple hundred what do you mean you downgrade it this, if it's the dream system you should have to downgrade anything no, or right, is there more than the one system yeah just the dream system if, if it's like cost no object why wouldn't you put like a i mean if it were me i'd put a high-end sound card in there too but i will update it with the new sound card the new new nanu nanu no all right well let's uh jump into the picks of the week uh, I've got a uh, one to start off with. Uh, if you guys know uh, good old, well, I guess originally they were called good old games. I think they're officially just GOG now. Uh, but GOG is a it's a company owned by CD Projekt Red, the developer who makes like The Witcher and the upcoming Cyberpunk. And they've got their DRM free store. And a couple years ago, they introduced the GOG Galaxy client, and it was a fine little client for kind of downloading the games. Um, did some some cloud save stuff. And they're just launching now, I think it would launch today, was the beta for GOG Galaxy 2.0, uh, which is they're hoping to make a more robust sort of all-in-one launcher. You can, add, just like with Steam, you can add non-GOG games from any platform and even console games, they said. Now, it won't obviously won't launch the console games, but you can kind of manage a library of all of your games across all platforms through this, uh, this app. I really have only had a chance to play around with it for a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll see how it, how it turns out. It is in beta, but it's a very nice graphical update. Uh, the functionality that they're hoping to add seems pretty cool. Uh, so, uh, it has you, a shopping you know, cart. Uh, yeah, I don't think the app, the it galaxy does. client or does have a shopping cart. Okay. Where is that? Oh, it t- does. It's, but that's sort of tied into the store. A browser inside of the app. Yeah. Yeah. Of. yeah. 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 But, but uh, then within that browser, there's a shopping cart, which is magnificent 2019 technology. Absolutely, and uh, even things like uh, friends in one place. Everything, everything together. They're introducing a games discovery feature, 
uh, soon. It's like, will... it's, like, it's like iTunes with ping. You know, it's all your music and friends in one place. And hopefully at least as successful as that. At least. You don't use ping anymore? Huh. Ping doesn't exist anymore, right? Did they pull the plug on that? I mean, if you're on an old enough version of the software, it does. Ah, okay. <laughs> So uh, head over to GOG Gal or Geo Galaxy, so gogalaxy.com, geogalaxy.com, and you can sign up for the beta, and uh, it's free. You know, it's a free client, and uh, just have to have a GOG account. So check that out. Hey, Jim, to obnoxiously interrupt you yet again, does this remind, have you ever used Open EMU on the Mac? Open EMU? Yeah. No, I don't think so. It's a that? wonderful front end for oh, oh yeah almost anything uh, yes I, I always say in my head open mu so i was confused well, maybe it is yeah open yeah. MU. but the that's very similar looking i was just kind of looking at it like and especially if it has like the drag and drop stuff that's just what open mu or emu does where you like have a file and you drop it in and then it finds the cover art and puts it on your virtual shelf for you mm -hmm. so same kind of idea but that's it's very slick looking this new 2.0 of gog galaxy which i've only recently use GOG Galaxy at all. I was a holdout with my, you know, individual installer files and folders and things. This it's a lot easier obviously to use their front end. Yeah, and the the original the current public version, the 1.0 is not it's not a bad. It's it's a pretty nice little simple thing except it's it's really limited to basically launching your own games and you know, your GOG games and cloud saving and stuff. This looks much more robust and more modern, so yeah. Very nice. I've noticed they've also been updating a lot of games, including older ones that I've had for a long time, to support yeah. cloud save. So it seems mm -hmm. like pretty much everything, even like some of the oldest DOS games I have, will support that. Yeah, it's very it's it's a Apparently really I've been a member since 2011. Yeah, I, I joined whenever they. I mean, when when they were still good old games, like in the very first yeah. iteration, and I've got quite a few, quite a few games in that library. But, uh, all right, Jeremy, you're up. What do you got for us? Well, uh, as we alluded to earlier, there is a really damn good reason to be buying AMD right now. Uh, the cumulative impact of MDS, Zombie Load, and Spelter, Spectre Meltdown, L1TF, MDS, and all of the other fun things really doesn't affect AMD's architecture. So why not pick up the second gen 2920X for literally the exact same price as the first gen one? Because the first gen one is also selling right now for 800 bucks Canadian. Uh, sales pretty much similar down in the States. So why go with the first gen when you can get the second gen with significantly higher frequencies? And it doesn't care so much about all of these security uh, fixes that you really probably should be installing I, we're going from a lot of uh, intel systems seeing a 20 percent, 25 percent drop to these guys seeing maybe a seven percent drop in worst case scenarios so it's it's and we know sadly that we're not going to get the next generation of threadripper at computex it's a while off so there's no reason not to upgrade now if you've been holding off don't torture yourself for another six or eight months go for it I, I will say I'm not entirely sure that we won't see Threadripper sooner than we think. I hope so. I don't know for sure, but I heard I heard a little something that indicated that those rumors may have been premature. May have been premature. So we'll, well see. What about the possibility that Threadripper becomes kind of unnecessary if you have Ryzen processors that go up to like 16 cores, 32 threads? Then is there really a need for a Threadripper that to bridge the gap between Ryzen desktop, which you could have like a high end desktop Ryzen, kind of like you have the HEDT stuff from Intel, and then then there's Epic. So like Intel does, you know, obviously Core, and then they have high end Core, and then they have Xeon. But does that make any sense? Like, do you still need a dedicated workstation only like kind of processor that isn't an Epic server processor? And then you have really high end 16 or higher core count desktop processors that just sort of cannibalizes the Threadripper market, especially if the desktop yes, stuff is because, higher clock speed. You know, I think um, 
Threadripper was really interesting, and it was a good product for the time. And it filled a niche. But I think that AMT looked at it and said, you know what, this is cannibalizing our epic sales. And even though it was great for the consumer, it probably was not great for AMD in terms of their margins, what they were trying to do, because they didn't sell them for all that much more than the highest end Ryzen desktop processors, and, you know, at the end, and especially with the 1950 hitting below 500 bucks. And that's a tremendous value for anybody. Um, so it's, it's, you know, I think AMD probably took a look at it and may, you know, I, I don't have any inside information here mm. and I, don't know if if there won't be another thread ripper but it just seems to me with the way that they have things set up with the chiplets and the io chip and the ability to put you know two chiplets plus the io on a single die to give you you know 16 cores and 32 threads um that gives them a lot of leeway to be able to bring down some epic skews that are still epic still has the name still has the same basic architecture, but in workstations so that they don't have three different things to kind of worry about. And I think that may be where they're going to. Uh, it makes more sense from them in terms of SKUs and uh, how they're addressing the market. But, you know, we'll, we'll see if this, you know, turns out to be the case. But I, I think that in many ways, Threadripper really did eat away at, at some of the potential gains that epic could have made i mean they they share the same socket essentially i mean tr4 is different than what epic is uh in terms of of you know how many pins are actually active but you know it's it's the same socket so why why create more divisions when you could potentially just say hey let's create an epic skew for this and Ryzen for the rest. I mean, it, it just, it seems to make more sense that way. I could be wrong, but it seems to make more sense. Well, I mean, it's a small market share. Uh, and like, I like the, the sort of bastard child between Ryzen and Epic that Threadripper is because I do a little bit of video editing for random tasks and I run Boink constantly. Uh, SETI at home, Large Hadron Collider at home, Einstein at home. So I do get the full benefit of the ridiculous amount of uh, threads that I've got. I haven't yet gotten around to putting enough cards in it that I can, you know, fill up the PCIe lanes that uh, Threadripper offers compared to the Ryzen. But at the same time, AMD did get more cash out of me because the, the price difference between a 470 and a 399 motherboard is significant. So they did, in theory, get a little more, more out of me than if I'd had a choice between Epic and Ryzen, in which case I would definitely go Ryzen. I don't have the workload to justify even probably a lower cost Epic. Uh, and there, there are just some interesting issues that come into gaming mode and various other things. But at the same time, I, I it, it's a lot like SLI, Josh. I mean, it's it's a very small niche market that, yeah, it, it if you're taken away from Rome, which is going to make them significantly more money, and you can still make that rise in sale, it does make sense to discontinue it in a way. But honestly, I, I just, I, I, I'm just amused by Threadripper and the whole idea of this sort of mid-range, not really a workstation, not really a gaming processor, but able to do both. I guess we'll find out soon though. Well, you can't, you don't want to abandon that branding. That's, that's fantastic. That's a fantastic name for a part. A lot better than Opteron. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Uh, next up we've got, um, Josh, Josh has got something interesting for us here. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's, it's a monitor calibration tool. And it's free. You can download it, put it in your monitor, and with a control click and, and, and your scroll wheel, you could adjust all of the things in there that, that you want to without having to go into 
you know, your monitor control thing and, and click all the buttons on your monitor. You have a, a tremendous amount of, of things that you can do uh, with, with just a software interface that's easier to run than going through 100,000 clicks with your, you know, monitor buttons and up and down and whatnot. It's just easier. You get used to it. You see it. It's free. And you can calibrate things really, really, really quickly. So thanks for uh, transmit this, for uh, pointing this out to me. Really appreciate it. And peace out. All right. So that's the, uh, the Click Monitor DDC utility. Free over at clickmonitordc.bplaced.net. Uh, but we'll have the link to this and all the picks in the show notes. All right. And let's, uh, let's finish it up with Sebastian. Uh, what do you have for us? Uh, Manfrotto tripod. It's a video tripod. So it has a fluid head. It's the 290, which is apparently an exclusive to Best Buy. It's on sale this week for 30 bucks off. And if you look at fluid head uh, tripods on Amazon or somewhere, it seems like they started around $120, $130. I picked one of these up. I've not opened it up yet. I got it today because I intend to do some video for the site. And I've tried using my trusty tripod I've had for the last five years, which is great for still photography. But... uh, the jerkiest, most horrible looking motion you've ever seen for video. So it was time to get something a little bit better. All right. So that's the, uh, yeah, the Manfrotto 290 with uh fluid head, fluid video head. Head. Yeah. For a Manfrotto mm. for video, it's that's cheap because those are easily $300 or more for the camcorder ones, but all right. I and uh, that's a Manfrotto and uh, my, it's fluid head. <laughs> yeah. You don't want too much fluid to collect in the head. But yeah. uh, that's all right. And uh, so that's at Best Buy. Uh, but I'm sure I, I've seen Manfrotto products at like Amazon and stuff. So just you yeah. know, shop there's, around. There's very similar models. That's like a Best Buy SKU. But there's almost identical stuff available on Amazon too. All right, great. Well, that's the, uh, that's the show. Uh, thanks for joining us. Apologies if you're listening live for our late start. Uh, just uh, the, uh, what's, what's the gr- gremlins in the, uh, in the wires? What's the excuse for all the technical difficulties we had? Incompetent there host. Is no Incompetent host. Yes, That's exactly. the excuse. Phone exactly. system. Yeah. Well, uh, as as uh, we said, we do record Wednesdays normally at 10 p.m. Eastern, uh, 2 a.m. UTC. But uh, next week, because of Computex, I'll be in Taipei for the entire week. So we're gonna, you know, we're not sure yet. I've I've, I've not been there before. I have to get over there and see what the network uh, situation is like and the availability of everyone because of the time difference but we'll try to have something if we uh if we do have a podcast live uh we'll let you know through our uh subscription uh i'm sorry our email subscription service at pcpro.com slash subscribe so add your email there to be notified or check twitter or you know pcpro.com slash live uh to to follow us there and we may not do something live it may because of that those difficulties we may just do some pre-recorded stuff and get it uploaded and into the feeds so uh, be sure to check that out as well. Thanks so much uh, for joining us uh, here, and uh, we will uh, we'll see you hopefully next week. But if not live next week, uh, we'll be back the following week. But stay tuned to PCPro.com all next week. We'll have the news written up as it becomes available. All right. Well, everyone have a great week. We'll see you next time.